Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod episode 65. I'm John Furry with Dave Vellante. Dave, good to see Johnny you. Johnny Boy, what's little, happening? A little salute there. Textbook <laughs> salute. <laughs> That's your patent. Like the shirt. Like the Cal yeah. shirt. It's uh -huh. awesome at Cal. Go, Love go, that stadium. Go, go Bears. Go Bears. I went there and go with my heels. kid. It was beautiful. We went up. There was nobody there. We climbed up to the top of the stadium. It was awesome. Yeah. Inspiring. It's kind of great. Great university. I get the old go bears and tent whenever I wear this shirt, even in Manhattan. And I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bear dad. My daughter went there. Also, when I wear the North Carolina stuff, go heels. I get that from all the alumni. I get it too. You and uh, U of A with Pilar, it's like you know, bear down. You know? Cal, University of Berkeley, California, Berkeley, Cal, as they call this guy, huge alumni network. And actually, Data Bricks, those guys are there. And University of North Carolina, the Tar Heels, they got a huge base too they're all like these quiet deep alumni networks we're talking about harvard and these ivy league schools you know those schools have deep deep capabilities and and great alumni and, and you know I, you know it's just great to see so i i like to wear the proud swag but what a great week dave it's been uh you know summer is coming up we had just through the window of all of our shows um time to retrench take care of some of the business we got super cloud event coming up uh, in studio, we got a lot of in studio events. I just covered ABS Cup Public Sector Summit, now called the DC Summit. We did it remotely through our new studio remote capabilities, which has been phenomenal. We've been phasing that in over time. So, you know, shout out to our Palo Alto and Boston studio teams, who have just been absolutely crushing it. Nice. Just more content coming in, scaling up the AI with the cube is working great. So, I feel good. I feel refreshed. I took, I had to sleep for two days straight. I was so tired. Uh, but, you know, that's the life of the cube and event season. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, my eye watch went off like last night. I'm sitting there having a cocktail, watching the debate. And it's like, your heart rate's over a hundred beats per second. <laughs> it says you're resting. I'm like, oh, fucking hey, like Jesus Christ, we're fucked. Uh, just oh, kept on thinking. The debate was a disaster. Uh, the only positive thing about the debate last night between Biden and Trump was the fact that they were talking about golf handicaps. I'm like, there's no way that Donald Trump's Biden's a six handicap. Uh, Trump won a national, uh, won his club championship. It's just these guys are liars. Uh, but Biden really, really bit, was looked poor. And I think all my all my Democrat friends, because I'm an independent, um, were all like really sour. And CNN was like, you could see them so visibly visceral upset. And then I'll see the headlines change a little bit in the press because they want to actually go after Trump. It's all about stopping Trump. And you know, Biden is just he's just not there, dude. He's like we called it on the cube before. Um, if you're under the age of 30, you just can't know he's not going to get any votes. Even if you're under the age of 30, my kids are texting me. It's like, who is this? This is a clown car. Both of them were terrible. And, it was and really bad. You know, so talking about uh, handicaps, golf handicaps, you know, Trump is an epic cheater. Did, there's this book by uh, Rick Riley. It's called Commander and Cheat. It's it's hilarious, the stuff that Trump pulls. He'll like, he'll like pick up on a chip in. Yeah, I'm an excellent chipper. <laughs> that's good yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and six foot gimmies <laughs> <you're right. laughs> uh, uh, but oh it was so bad i i you know a lot of people have been calling for a, a swap and like this may have been the the pushed it over the edge but i heard this morning scaramucci on tv was give a little tidbit which is a little bit disconcerting that you have to within 40 days you have to be on the ballot in Ohio. If you're not on the ballot within 40 days, you won't be on the ballot. So if they're going to swap out Biden for another candidate, they got 40 days to get that candidate on, on the Ohio ballot. And you, Democrats are not going to win without Ohio. I mean, very rare that that happens, but it's still yeah. a possibility. But you got to be on every ballot, right? And so I don't know. Is is you know Newsom, Widmer? Uh, no, no way Joe Manchin's going to be accepted by the far left. And it was just. It was sad to see, but you know, everybody's like, oh, we're in shock. Why are you in shock? Like, they should have seen this coming. I mean, they, they had their well, heads in the surprise. sand. Well, it's a surprise. It was just Anderson, really bad. Anderson, Plus he had a cold. It was just, it was bad. Oh, Anderson Cooper went after Kamala Harris big time in the, after the post-debate spin room. I saw room. that. I and, saw that. She was he, trying to defend it. It was bad. It, he, he was visibly upset. I mean, the Democrats, like, I don't know what they, what they were, what they were feeding them, the, the, all the lines. He's not, he's just losing it. And so, you know, if you're a foreign country, you look at this, it's just, it's just like if you're a young person or a foreign country, so this is our, our government. I predict this over a decade ago that we'd have a revolution inside our company and our country. And and 
you know, I think it's time for the new generation. You're starting to see the Vivex of the world come out on the Republican side, but no one from the Democrat side has risen up yet as like, hey, you know what? It's time for younger, div- you know, diversity on the generational side. De- generational diversity is the buzzword everyone's talking about. And there's a new generation coming up and they have to take control of the whole new, whole new issues in government, how government's using technology. And this kind of came up in the DC summit with AWS. Generative AI is changing public-private partnerships. Healthcare is impacted because now you got government mandated stuff and then you got private sector. So we are in a major transformation on government. And, you know, I'm just going to continue to bang my drum, which is anti-political stuff, but mostly on the technology side, which is technology is changing society, including governments. And the government has to figure this out. Old cronyism, old beltway bandits, um, kind of old school stuff is antiquated and outdated. It's got to go. The acuity of our people at an office is has to be a test. Maybe they just have to drop the limits of age. You can't be over the age of 80 to be, and be president. I think they should really wow. have someone who's got their mental faculties together and saying, look, you got to have your shit together. Now I like the golf handicap things. If you can play golf and get a six handicap, I'm, I'm voting for you. So any, any president who's got a six handicap, either, either they're super smart or not doing their job because you know, to get a six handicap, you got to play a lot. Wait, you know? who has yeah. a six handicap? That's what Biden said. He claimed he said it's, during, he said oh during, when I was a VP, I was down to a six handicap that's like shooting 78 dave or 82 on like tough courses i mean actually like I scott went to, mcneely good yeah Maybe i mean <laughs> you know, we, we had an old joke and in, in when i was in in um and working for the big company if you had a good golf game that means you weren't doing your job because uh, you were out practicing playing so Pat mcgovern used yeah. to say i'm terrible at golf i have no time and that was like a signal <laughs> to us all don't be golfing on my time <laughs> but you know on, on the age thing I, when I think Kennedy was JFK was like 43, maybe when he became president and even Nixon on their first debate, I think Nixon was in his forties. And when Nixon became president, he was in his mid fifties. Yeah. So we're talking about, you know, decades older. It's just both of these guys too old, but Trump mopped them up yesterday. I mean, and and you know, it helped that they, everybody's saying this, it was just repeating all this stuff, but it helped that it muted his mic because he couldn't misbehave. And he just came across as the far more cogent and, and presidential, not that they, Trump is anything close to presidential, but they kind of did him a favor by muting him because it made him look presidential because he couldn't talk. Um, and Biden certainly was in a bad spot because it focused all his attention on, he had to say, and he couldn't put words and sentences together. So, you know, that's a split screen and he had his mouth agape the whole time. The the problem here's, here's the other problem is that the media is so biased. Okay. And this is a great example. You know, I've been on the rant about media, old school media has got to change and we're digital. We were, we're on the other side of that. We're modern. We're open. We're about getting information and having people source information. AI is only going to help that. Um, but the media game will be changed by AI. We can talk about that in another, in, after. But CNN was so over the top protective of the fact that they were so biased because both those uh, uh, moderators have been on the record essentially slamming Trump. And so what they over, they over rotated on the fact of being too good. They were actually really good moderators in the sense that they kept it going. They got all the issues out there. They didn't try to look biased. In fact, and when they should have done is called them out on their lies. So again, the question is what is the role of the moderator in these debates? Because on one hand, if you look at the list of lies between both parties, Trump's list was massive. Okay. And he still told a lot of lies or embellished lie embellish, same thing, non-factual. Biden also was unfactual. So it's just that Trump tipped the scales on the lies. Biden was lying too. So, you know, uh, like he's got support from the police and border patrol, which we all know he doesn't. Okay. So what this means is, is that media has created so much of a, of a polarization and antitrust is that people watching are like, I don't know who to trust. And this is why I think the old school media has got to go because now you have multiple sources you have multiple ways to get data. And I think you're going to see this new generation, the GameStop generation, I call it. We're going to source things differently. And I think this is going to change change the game a little bit. But you know, the moderator, what's the role of a debate? It wasn't really a debate. It was basically like you know, 90 minutes of two people talking fight. about their they hate fight. each other. Yeah. Talk about golf. This is ridiculous. So I just, you know, talk about it, trust. It was, it's like it was discover. It was discouraging. George, George Carlin had it right. Just don't everything the government says, just, just don't believe them. <laughs> just ignore it. Is they're lying to you, I, and nobody trusts the government anymore. But but the interesting thing now is okay. So Trump is a clear front runner. You know how I feel about Trump. Not a fan. Yeah. You know January sixth. You know the yeah. whole thing of of stopping the peaceful transfer of power, irrespective of the policies. And we can debate that all day long. But it's just 
you know how I feel. But yeah. if he's for front runner, Lena Khan out, right? New yeah. Attorney General. There's going to be a whole different. What about taxes? You know, what does that actually mean for the economy? Yeah. Um, and the stock market. So that's kind of interesting. And I say they got 40 days to figure out a successor. I saw a, a bunch of folks on TV today kind of defending Biden. Eh, you know, he just had a bad race kind of thing. No, he was it's dead. Like, on arrival. oh boy, he really? Dead. He was dead on arrival. I mean, it was bad. Okay. It was bad. Look, so, I mean, the bottom line is, is that the people are going to look for these new candidates, and and politics has to get more candidates. Um, the Democratic Party should have seen this coming. They should have had a candidate ready to go, and but that the Republicans have no other alternative. And Trump, with his base, um, is so strong that he just rolled into with his numbers, and Biden's just collapsing around him. And Biden didn't even defend anything he was just he was just couldn't even compete he literally crazy. could not fight back it's crazy i mean i mean the people will crawl through glass for trump you know yeah. the middle part of the country they absolutely love this guy and i understand why i just the funny thing is i really like a lot of people who love trump they're like good friends of mine i don't like trump but i i love a lot of the people who like him and i can understand why they're pissed well the thing that i'm finding out i you know i've got four kids they're all under the age of 30s and they're all adults now young adults and others i talk to and i get a try to get a pulse and take the temperature there's a real shift towards centrism being in the center more and i think this whole left wing right wing thing there's a far extremes is almost taking it too far they almost bunkered in on their positions and their ideology and their dogma i think the general people just want to want good old fashioned capitalism and they want, you know, um, socially liberal policies and conservative fiscal stability. And, you know, when you have inflation and, and, and stuff hits your pocketbook and businesses are being taxed, I mean, I'm pro business. So I'm from the party of business. I believe that the government should stay out of the way of small business, let them grow and tax the big business that, that are making the bank, not just put business into one category. And I've, a lot of people don't understand that. Like we're self-funded business, we're growing. And the more we get taxed, the less we can hire. Right. So I think tax is a huge problem. Again, I've been a big fan of the old Steve Forbes is flat tax, 18% for everybody, credit card filing, send it in. You make billions of dollars, you pay 18%. You make 20 grand, you pay 18%. You know, just simple math, no loopholes, and make that it and done. So again, I think a society is going to rebel. I think no one's going to put up with another four years. If Trump gets elected, it's going to be a disaster. If Biden gets elected, it's basically a bunch of people behind the scenes pulling strings. And the question is, who would be pulling those strings? Kamala Harris, Obama, Oprah, uh, who? Liz Warren. But I mean- yeah. Okay, so so, but it looks like these. This is what we're getting. The, the Dems are digging their heels in. It looks like Joe's not going to step down. He will um, lose to Trump. I'm telling you right now. There's right. No so way he gonna, wins. So let's assume that he's going to lose to Trump. So Lena Khan is out. So maybe M and A is back. So that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, China policy, you know, more tariffs, you know, and and so what does that mean? It could mean actually a stronger dollar. But, you know, you got more protectionism. I'm generally not in favor of, of tariffs. Yeah. Um, and so now tech, what does it mean for tech? What does it mean for crypto? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be it weird. Social Cause, media. Cause he was he was anti Amazon. The problem with Trump is he shows the vendettas and he's not pragmatic. So you know how in the AI world we talk about hallucinations and guardrails. <laughs> you put guardrails around Trump. If he gets elected, instead of trying to fight him and take him down, just. Just neuter him. Put some guardrails in place. Let him do his shit. Let him build the wall. Let him lower taxes. Let him do some things, and then four years, count the minutes, and then reset. But he'll and, you know flip flop yeah. on a lot of his his policies as well. A lot of his stances. He flip flop on crypto. You know, I don't know. You heard him on on abortion last night. He's like talking about killing babies. I don't know where he got that. That's like absurd. Nobody's I mean, talking about doing. I mean, that. His, I mean first of all, Roe v. Wade should just be never be touched with. Leave it the way it is. Keep it like what it is. If there's state issues, I mean, I like the idea of the founding fathers push stuff to the states. That's the way it was supposed to be. And some states will have uh, anti-abortion, some will be pro-abortion. So let people travel. And we can see companies that are fu are funding people to travel to states. So you know, the issue there is that the people who lose the ones are the low-income brackets. And, and again, this is the problem. You don't touch Roe v. Wade. It's a third rail. Screw the right wing, hardcore right wings. You know, deal with it. You don't want people to have abortions. Just educate them. Put some church into them. Give them some, give them education. Tell them, you know, put more money, donate money into causes that will help people. So I, I think Roe v. Wade should be un, is untouchable in my mind. It should be foundational, 
and cemented. No one should touch with that in my opinion. Well, the in, fact in, that, that my daughters have less rights than my my mother uh, in terms of their choice is kind of absurd. Man, I just don't, you know, don't. My daughters versus their grandmother had my grandmother had more rights than my daughters. Just in, accept um, it and move on, geez. guys. Whoever's listening from Trump's campaign or whatever. All right, let's get let's move on to the tech because the, the politics. Yeah. My, my heart rate's going up. My watch. Yeah. Is going <laughs> yeah. up again. I'm literally. I said, it's I, like, did you watch the whole thing? I I, 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 I honestly I tapped my, out. Honestly, I my heart out. my heart rate was going up. Like, oh, this is a train wreck. Oh my god, this is so bad. I was like, literally, my watch went off. Alarm! Your heart beats and it says you're resting. I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> I'm gonna drop dead. Who do I call? What's that? What's that thing? I've fallen and I can't get up, kind of thing, you know. So it was just bad. This just shows you how people. I'm sure people were having the same reaction. CNN, right after the debate, everybody was like blown out of their minds. They were like, like they got hit by a train. They were like blown away. They visibly, visibly upset. Uh, it was bad, and that was the reaction around around the world. So we'll see how we'll see how it goes. All right, so Dave, let's get into some of the quick news. I want to dive into it. So we had the VMware Broadcom laid out on the cube this week. The five point two of VCF VMware Cloud Foundation. This is the big bet from Broadcom. So we want to get into discuss that. Google Gemini uh, one point five as one million token context window. That's a big was a big news from the CEO today from Google Cloud. Amazon's market cap top two trillion. They're a trillion behind the other two. I still can't believe Amazon's at two trillion. I think they could get to three. If 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 NVIDIA and Microsoft are at three, I think Amazon could get to three. So, you know, I'm not a stock advisor, so don't take my advice, but I love them at three, three trillion. Um, I, Amazon's working on a new AI chatbot to compete with OpenAI. That's the rumor. Which is based on Olympus, which we we'll talked see, about. We'll see what that is. Uh, Perplexity, a company we've been you know, falling all over and loving the company, is under heat because they've been apparently scraping and Wired Magazine, Forbes have been calling them out. Um, and now Amazon apparently is investigating Perplexity. They say it's not a problem. Um, but, you know, look at Perplexity. They should scrape. It's open web. Let's keep the web open. And uh, if robots.txt and the publishers don't like it, get a good business model. Get around it. You know, well, they're, they're griping they're, about the don't look here. Don't look here. Look away. Well, well they, actually, <laughs> they actually advertise the pages on robots. Is that a legal thing, John? Well, what, do you, what, is, what is it? What is the command that, that tells bots not to search, it's, it's not, not to crawl? It's not illegal, right? It's what's it's, it called? What's no, it called? There's, there's uh, no follow on the links, and the robot.txt yeah, no lays out the pages. So, is it a law? Is it the law that you can't do that? No, it's or no is law. It just, it's, 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 it's a matter it's, of ethics. And it's and internet. It's internet culture. We used to have this back on the web. Don't frame websites. It's like not cool. But we're at a time now where, first of all, with perplexity, if you go to perplexity and put siliconangle.com into the search query, they hit our site and start crawling. That's their that's their position, um, and that's what's going on there. And I think they should do it. It's they're the next Google. People love Google. It provides a lot of referral traffic. So the websites like Forbes and others have to refigure out their media so that they could create and community models around people discovering stuff out all on the hinterlands and endpoints of the web, whether it's Perplexity, Google, LinkedIn. You know, you push content out that gets discovered, and they should navigate to a place. It used to be a website. Now they're applications. So I think this is a game changer. I think perplexity is a is a is a marker in time that uh, that's going to show the how the generative AI is changing user um, discovery expectations around how to find stuff and connect with people and content. So I love perplexity. It's my number one. It's it's by far it's my, better my than number one AI. You know, well, I, I use I, I use ChatGPT a lot too, and several others. But those are my my one and two. What, I, what, I, what I like about it is it's neural network based. So when you're in a query, you're in a neural pathway, yep. so to speak. And so you can do follow on questions. So you're already in the, in the zone. If you was, you're down the lane, you're in a path. So it clusters all this content around more graph and neural, neural data. And that's the new model that I love. And I think that's going to be less of just querying some unstructured database and, and, and getting stuff on key. This makes fact, it makes all these LLMs make fact checking so much easier. You still got to really, you know, think through and you got to have some knowledge, some tribal knowledge, but it just makes it much, much easier than search. Can I just go back to, to Gemini at a million sure. uh, token context window? Didn't they announce that at Google next in April? So this is what, is this just a GA announcement? Or what is that? Well, Thomas Curian had posted this on Twitter. That's the whole point on Twitter and LinkedIn. They announced it. And huh? essentially, yeah, they did. So I'm pretty sure they announced it at Google Next. So this must just be they're shipping it now or it's actually working. No, it's yeah. available now. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's available. A G, it's a GA announcement, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and it's it's got a bigger context window. So this is more data can go in. That's the whole point. The um, 
Uh, other quick news I want to get out before we, we get start digging into this is that China's ByteDance is working with Broadcom to develop advanced AI chips by Reuters and source that news. I bring that up because you and I had a conversation um, when and, and NVIDIA had their GTC conference. We also went to the Broadcom Financial Conference, and Broadcom did not disclose who their third or fourth big partner was. Third. Third. and you, For custom for custom. So custom chips, yeah, custom silica. You took a chance and said, "Hey, my sources and my data is pointing to Byte Dance." So, hey, yeah. an another one, another win for the Cube Research. Team. Yeah, we I think Good we call it, we nailed that one. So Meta, well, Google, we know was number one. They've had a relationship with Google for ten years. Meta, we suspected, we pretty much know was number two. They've had a relationship there for four or five years. Of course, Hawk Tan's on the board of Meta. And then we said, it's got to be ByteDance. That was our number one pick. It could have been some others, but we said, no, it's, it's, we think it's ByteDance. And remember, one of the analysts, these analysts are sharp, one of them asked, are there restrictions to selling to China? And Charlie Kawas said, no, there aren't any restrictions selling this, this yeah. ASIC or whatever we're developing to China. I don't even think he said maybe he said at this time, he might've said at this time. So that was like, okay, we tried to, the analyst tried to tease out, you know, was it bite dance? And, um, and now I guess that's, that's confirmed several months later, but that's big. They've got three huge, durable custom Silicon customers that are essentially their backdoor competition to NVIDIA. They compete with NVIDIA in a lot of different ways, particularly in networking and and NICs and so forth. Um, but now it's even like in, you know, ASICs or sort of whether it's TPUs or, or, or GPU like capabilities, they're sort of backdoor to competing with NVIDIA. Yeah. And that's a, it's like the best backdoor. I'd rather be them than having to try to compete head on with NVIDIA like AMD and Intel are trying to do. It's going to be fun to watch, but that happens. It's a huge install base. And obviously, it's going to be massive. Oh, speaking of Meta, you brought up Meta. Meta uh, report came out from Bloomberg that Apple was in talks to integrate Meta's yep. models into their Saw AI. That. And they didn't because of privacy reasons and quality reasons. So the, remember, at the Worldwide Developer Conference that Apple had, they announced the deal with OpenAI. So, you know, we always compare uh, the the iPhone versus Android. And... um John Trudeau at Madrona brought this up months ago, maybe a year ago on the cube. There's the AI, there's the Android approach open, and then there's the proprietary kind of the iPhone approach. If you look at the iPhone doing a deal with open AI, it kind of makes sense. One, it's a, it's a bigger model and, and more baked product wise, but it's also proprietary where Meta is open and some say sp quite spammy. So that was interesting news. Um, we'll see what that means. If the Meta can bring it down to the device level, you might maybe they do the deal with Android or other devices, but Apple certainly aligning with OpenAI, a huge win for Sam Altman and the team there. So, but so, but remember too, Meta's open source license uh, has a little fine print in it. It's not licensed under Apache 2.0, which basically says anybody can do anything. It, it essentially says you know, something to the effect of, if you're a hyperscaler, we can charge you. <laughs> you can come back and and negotiate. All right, so it's not an Apache 2.0 license like Unity, for example, when Matei, you know, open sourced it. They open sourced it under Apache 2.0. That's a huge deal, but there are restrictions. And that's why some of the, you know, contacts that we've talked to who are building their own LLMs internally, like big banks are saying, no, we don't want to use open source because we don't trust because they could pull the rug out from under us. So I wonder if that's part of, was part of the negotiation with Apple. Well, a lot of action going on, obviously. Um... I mentioned the Amazon's coming out with a chip. Chip chip mania is happening um, everywhere. So we'll see if if it becomes a bubble. But certainly, we need we need faster and better power management on these chips. The um, the thing about this week on VMware, Dave, I want to let that dig in some of these bigger topics. So this week we broadcasted Broadcom's VMware division had this VCF VMware Cloud Foundation 5.2 news. And they kind of cleared the air. We had six videos. We did that launch. We did in-depth interviews. We now have about 50 videos from that, bunch of stories. You guys did a bunch of research at the Cube Research team. This is the big bet by Broadcom on the on the acquisition. They had about 1,000 to 2,000 big customers uh, that this product talks to. They got hundreds of thousands of users and customers and probably say, what, 35,000 total real user uh, customers besides these, but, but the, the core, the core base is about say 2000, one to 2000. 
that could qualify for this. This is their mother's chip product. And the integration is a top priority. They cleaned up the partnerships, OEMs, hyperscalers, cloud service providers, and resellers. They're going to change the economics in the channel. So this is a radical ecosystem focus, not radical, but just a simplified, clearer version. It's not the old organic VMware. It's the new VMware. Um, and so I, I took away from that that welcome to VMware 2.0 under Broadcom. Things are simpler. You pay more. But you get more, hopefully. And, and so I got, maybe Jensen's law kicks in. The more you spend, the yeah, more you save. It. So I got some. I got some shit for our, our cube. Now, of course, we it was sponsored, so it was was paid for. So we, you know, we didn't like like slam. But I think uh, the the roundtable we did with Christoph and Rob Stretche and you and me, I, we were being honest. The grief that I got was, you know, of course, from VMware competitors, lack of innovation, lack of modernization. Um, which you know, okay. I I I think the the key here is it's a new business model. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Um. And, and it's like you said, they're simplifying the 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 pricing. They're raising pricing, and they've done the math. I'm sure. But the key to me is will Broadcom, and I believe they will apply their sort of same model to VMware that they have done to CA that they've done in the semiconductor business. Yeah. So to me, it's the same philosophy: narrow the base. Narrow, narrow the focus on on customers. Spend the money on R and D. Keep people in. Yeah. Well, well first of all, and make first. it more attractive for them to stay than to leave. And I'm getting all of these inbounds, text and emails and so forth on. No, this company's leaving. This company's leaving. That company's leaving. I know big banks that have left already. I, I would like to dig into that more. Yeah, we'll, and, dig into it. we'll dig into it, and I don't see it, right? So first, I'm of just all, saying. Others have said, "Oh no, they've moved their mission critical stuff." Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you look into it. It's like, oh, well, it was some data warehouse or data mart that they moved. It was mission critical data mart. So I, I, I I've learned from Floyer over the years. You just got to question this stuff when it comes to migrations. You really got to dig in, look at the workload, how it's tied to the business processes, and really ask the hard questions on the migrations. Because I just don't, I don't think people. These big customers who are running mission critical workloads are going to be able to easily move off VMware. And I think it's actually going to be a better business case for them to stay if, if Broadcom makes the investments in R and D. First of all, I mean, well, let's get to the um what's going to roll, how it's going to roll out under Broadcom. Because remember, this is a different VMware. Um, and so the people who are complaining that it depends on who you talk to, it's like different vectors of complaints and either sour grapes or just lack of awareness. Okay. We've been covering VMware since the cube started 14 years ago. So we know a lot about VMware. I'm in Palo Alto. That's where the headquarters was. That's where a lot of the employees were. We've seen the growth from Paul Moritz days, even through Broadcom. And we know a lot about Broadcom. So I think we can speak with certainty when, when we say that when we do interviews with the senior executive, we kind of know what's going on. So here's what I would say to those, the critics. Yes. And no, yes, there's complaints. But it depends. VMware has grown to be a behemoth relative to the hypervisor and virtualization. They also did a lot of acquisitions and built new stuff and have a, a tech stack. So they, they they got a lot of stuff. And, and the question I want to ask you, and this is rhetorical, really, where has VMware been innovative besides acquisitions? Okay. I mean, honest question. Right. Besides, but outside of vSphere, what have they done that's been innovative? They've done a few moves. I've seen some things there, but they've had more missteps and stuff they've tried. But the growth of the company organically just was phenomenal. I think about five years ago, maybe they they kind of got stuck too bloated and they had to realize, wow, we didn't really have a lot of innovation. But they got everything. And if and what I what I'm taking away from the Broadcom and my assessment is, and I'll stand by this, happy to debate with anyone from whoever's complaining, wants to talk about innovation, because we we know what that looks like. VMware's not innovating right now. They have to integrate. And what right. we, and they have everything. They have the customers, and if you're a customer and you don't qualify for this VCF framework Cloud Foundation, you're not going to use it. So you either leave, or you use the VMware Foundation, vSphere Foundation products, or just go somewhere else. Yeah, and be on, use the, on use, you know just use just, the cloud, just use Amazon, get off, get off maintenance. Uh, and but I think yeah. that a lot of those crap locations are going to go. I've said that. I, I don't. I don't dispute that at all. Those are easy to migrate. They're low risk. If don't get them, get out of there. That would be yeah. my advice to customers. Don't, if you don't need that full suite, why would you pay the increased yeah. pricing? Get out. There's so many, there's plenty of options. You can if go you, to Red Hat. You can go to Nutanix. You can go to Microsoft, Hyper-V. You can do KVM. HPE, IBM. Get, HPE, <laughs> get out of there. Get no, no problem. But for your core stuff, be careful. 
well, well here's the thing there and i asked them that by the way if you look at the videos I'll, I'll find the clip and i'll publish it we i asked them specifically that you're betting the ranch that a, a company in your 1000 or 2000 targets are going to be the uh, private cloud candidates meaning fully operational cloud operations that means on in public cloud on premises and edge meaning you're running applications with kubernetes full-blown cloud scale to prepare for generative ai every single company that has any chops or any scale that's did that's on the digital transformation has to build the infrastructure to set the up the run for the generative ai tsunami of applications there will be a cambrian explosion of applications on generative ai clearly and that's both retrofitted applications with generative ai and net new applications so every company has to do this we've been reporting on the cube all year on this so the question is will it be vmware and that's what they're saying they're saying look at we're going to go for that vcf is essentially the platform where you have one license you pay a lot but you got a lot of things in there to build that environment and the license portability gives them the ability to move it to the cloud so whatever you want to go you do it it actually is a sound strategy the bet is will will there be demand for vmware will that tech stack be vmware and that's simply it that's what's going on they cleaned up their channel they cleaned up their oem partnerships they call it now the Broadcom Advantage Program. So they've done the work. Now, was it elegant? And did they get style points? Absolutely not. I no, mean, they definitely kind of, not. They, definitely not. They don't <laughs> get style points. You know, uh, they've made some, a lot of mistakes. I've heard so many things. I won't, I won't even get into it. But let me just tell you, some blunders of epic proportions have happened in the past eight months. They're recognizing and saying, hey, we're moving forward. Chris actually said that on the Cube. So, you know, you can throw rotten tomatoes at, at VMware Broadcom for the missteps and the transition bumps, but you know, they got to get to, you know, level playing field and just start again. And that's what they've done. And, and they said, and they've been very clear. And like you said, Hawk Tan's been clear about the acquisition moves, but from a business strategy, VCF is targeting one to 2000 of the top companies in the world. I'd say more like 700 and probably only a hundred actually thinking about this right now in earnest. The, you know, and that have full cloud operations. And and we know that people aren't aren't just repatriating. They're saying, I got public cloud. We got data processing in there. I use higher level services, but I need to also set up my on-premises now GPU farms and or other compute and inference to run those private apps with my data. And I got edge with its office buildings or devices. So this is happening. So the question is, will it be VMware? That's the question that we have to look at. To your point, we have to get in and start unpacking what people, why people are leaving if they are. And two, the cost of ownership. I heard from one customer at an event this past two months. I won't say what event because it'll tell, tip away the customer, big customer, not full VCF target, but enough that is sizable estate, uh, tech stack and, and technology estate. They said, quote, it's a five year, it's a five year migration. Dave, five years. How do you migrate five years? You can't. It's everything's changing by the day. Even at even a 24 month time frame is very tight. So that means the cost of ownership and switching costs come into play. So what no one really has done yet, haven't seen it, and we're digging into it at the Cube Research, is what is the real switching cost to dead off VMware? What is the real cost of ownership besides IT and license cost? of not capturing generative AI. So there's a whole nother level of complexity. It makes the Snowflake Databricks argument we had about who bundles what A to like, like kindergarten. Trivial. It's trivial. trivial. Do you, it, you, you were at Red Hat Summit, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So Ally Bank, there's supposedly there are a couple of banks. I know I know Ally Bank is one of the ones that's been put forth as they've migrated their, their entire VMware estate. I've dug into that. It's not true. They're still running uh, some VM workloads from what I've, uh, uncovered um but they have they have migrated off their mainframe which okay is not an easy thing to do so it's probably harder to migrate off a cobol mainframe than it is the software mainframe on vmware but there are a lot of similarities but there's no cobol on the latter but but to your point a five-year migration you're going to have to freeze the applications unhook the business processes rehook everything up it's just migrations are a tricky thing um and sh should be avoided at all cost unless there is such a compelling business case, which, you know, we'll see, like you said, we're digging into it. All right. What else is going on? Amazon. Um, obviously the market cap topped the 2 trillion. We're going to, I love this. I love this topic. 
Everybody okay. was calling for Jassy's head, you know, <laughs> and we were like, are you out of your mind? This guy's yeah. the one of the most competent. When you, when you do interviews in the cube, you really get a good sense as to yeah, yeah. who the top players he, are, the tech athletes. And he's yeah. top of the top. I mean, yeah. please. Andy's, Andy's a fan. I'm a fan of Andy Jassy. Maybe people, people might not understand him, but he gets the, he's very pragmatic and he understands business and scale. But yeah, but still my point about the two trillions, not just an accomplishment, Dave, it doesn't validate the fact that Amazon still got the muscle. It's a trillion behind Microsoft, all right? So, I mean, that to me is mind-blowing, how Microsoft just completely slingshotted ahead in value from Amazon. So Microsoft got a better business. Yeah, and so so again, so again, the question is, is there room on Amazon to go to three trillion? Because with Jassy at the helm, he's only a couple of years in, AWS is still throwing up most of the profits. Azure, not even as strong on the cloud as AWS, but Amazon's got the retail baggage. Can Amazon get the cash flow and generate a business model as good as Microsoft? That's I mean, I, I mean, you know, a software business model with you know marginal economics that go to zero with volume is, I think, generally a better business model than reselling every good in the world. But I mean, they have different businesses. I mean, Amazon's retail business is phenomenal. Best customer service. I heard, I read the other day that they're yesterday or today that they're actually doing direct shipping uh, in certain parts of China uh, from the manufacturer, which is really interesting because that's Alibaba's model and that's some of the other competitors' models. And Amazon's, of course, invested in all these warehouses. We we remember we put this forth as a disruption scenario for Amazon years ago, like during COVID, and so they're responding to that. I, I mean, it's just amazing the 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 vectors the levers that they can turn what they're doing in advertising thursday night football has been a home run and not to mention aws you know despite some of the challenges that aws has it's a fantastic business but i will say microsoft's a better business just from a business model standpoint and a financial standpoint because yeah. it's software and, and open it's, open ai just and it's a monopoly a and then open ai gave them a shot on the arm too well, so that was yeah. a home run all right. Well, you you got the. They don't necessarily make better products, by the way, but yeah, so, it's, it's a great business. So let me ask you, know, you about the, Microsoft. The, that is. Let me ask you a question about the valuations of companies. So you got Nvidia and Apple, two companies that have been soaring lately. Other analysts have been saying, "Oh, don't buy Apple." And since that, you know, a couple months ago, you know, when Apple <laughs> dipped, <laughs> what okay. was it? it was what was it? It was Nvidia's not a monopoly. Yeah. And don't buy Apple. And it's like since then. Nvidia's, of course, you know, added a trillion dollars to its market cap, and Apple's, you know, rebounded. You know, the big question is, is you know, is Nvidia sustainable? People are comparing it to Cisco. Cisco had multiples in in dot com that were absurd. Nvidia, Nvidia's got the same earnings multiple as it had, you know, two years ago or a year ago. I mean, it's not like it's, in that sense, it's not like it's overvalued. It's just insane the the numbers, but. You know, it's it's actually pretty reasonable for, by those metrics. Now, if it doesn't continue to perform and it doesn't continue to throw off the cash, well, that's an that's an issue. But from a multiple standpoint on earnings, you would say that it's actually pretty reasonable. The math works. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I tell you, I mean, with the moat conversation around Nvidia, obviously, I think you know the stock took a little bit of a haircut, mainly because I think the momentum's dropping a little bit but again it was insider like, selling too right that probably scares yeah, a people, lot of a yeah. lot of employees moved some stock that was reported people sell well. for a lot of reasons they only buy for one as uh peter lynch used to say yeah exactly and so 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 now you got the, the tech guys happening aws has got the event coming up dc summit just went down there the and that highlights the public sector side of it, but they changed the name from public sector summit to DC summit, mainly because of the commercial opportunities and the blending of the government. So you got the cloud guys trying to get revenue. Google's, you know, making some moves with Gemini. What, what's your what's your research showing on the Amazon versus um, Azure versus Google, Oracle? You know, Oracle's making noise now too. So what, what's your take on the cloud play? What's the research show? The research shows there's no question that Google's strategy to target enterprise and use its AI to, you know, get the, sometimes we say camel's nose under the tent is working. Google is gaining in enterprise AI. There's no question about it. They're gaining on Microsoft. Uh, when measured in terms of customer penetration, uh, you're seeing that gap between Amazon, uh, I said Microsoft, I meant Amazon. They're, that gap between Amazon and Google is definitely compressing and I think it's a function of Google has, they got their own in-house, they got third party uh, uh, LLMs and, and relationships. Uh, they've got the stack 
and it's working. They've got, you know, great data platform. And so, you know, having said that, broadly across the cloud, Amazon continues to do well. They continue to to grow at, you know, whatever, 17, 18%. Google's growing at around the same clip as Azure. Um, and they should be growing a lot faster given their their size. But in that segment of AI, they're definitely, you know, closing the gap uh, on Amazon. Now, now the only thing is, what I what I've been trying to get to, and I don't really have the data yet, is 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 bedrock, uh, because Amazon has a different model. Amazon's basically reselling a lot of other folks' LLMs, even though I know they're working, you know, through Olympus and this new Greek god. I forget what it's called, uh, the thing you mentioned up top. Um, so I don't have great data yet on bedrock. Trying to get that. So a lot of, for instance, Anthropic's doing great. A lot of the Anthropic momentum could be through bedrock and likely is. So it's somewhat maybe negatively skews and penalizes the Amazon, but nonetheless, Google's got strong, strong momentum in, in AI. All right, well, let me ask you a question. What do you think about the um, the, the the agent technology? You just been, did a breaking analysis on this. The next data platform is a big super cloud event we're having in August. We got some amazing people teed up for that. We got Microsoft, we got AWS, got tons of uh, end user practitioners coming in. Um, that sets the table. This whole agent piece beyond the chatbot is becoming quite the conversation. And um, it's passe. I mean, chatbots is kind of like the entry-level AI from before generative AI. But you're starting to see movement now where the use cases in the enterprise and for people in general is augmenting the human role and or having agent technology, meaning help automate tasks. Um, what's passe and what's real? What are you seeing? Well, I think that Gen AI has really not, it's caught the world on, it's uh, the, to set the world on fire, but it hasn't set the enterprise ROI on fire. So you think about what's happening with Gen AI in the enterprise, it's code assist, which is awesome. It's writing better marketing content, which is great. It's good, you know, improving customer service to an extent, great. But it hasn't been, you know, massive ROI. It's just, it's this request and response model, and the the amazing, the magic of it is you're doing it in natural language. Very cool. We can build graphics and awesome. But it's not really throwing off, you know, huge net present values. We think the next wave of AI uses Gen AI, but it's this thing, this buzzword you've probably heard called agentic AI, where agents are acting in concert. And they're working with other agents to actually perform not just a specific task, but a series of tasks to develop a plan and present plans. You know, it's got human supervision, but 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 some degree of autonomy to go out, make a plan, interact with other agents, understand the dependencies on those other agents, to harmonize the data, um, and then make present a plan back to uh, a, a professional. And so we see these essentially these digital factories being built where workflows are much more highly automated, that there's digital representations of the business, people, places, and things uh, that allow you to you know, cut a lot of waste that's in business today. And we think that's the next wave of, of, of AI. We call it, you know, it's called, we don't call it, we didn't coin the term agentic AI as in agents. And um, we think it's coming. We, we, there are a lot of examples. The RPA vendors are doing it. Uh, people are building this on top of Snowflakes, obviously, uh, uh, Snowflake and Databricks. Obviously, Microsoft is doing this. Uh, there's other examples. A really good example is Salesforce on the MuleSoft side of the business, doing some, some really fascinating things with integration and supply chain, uh, especially around Customer 360 and the Salesforce Data Cloud. So there's all these little pockets that are emerging that I think uh, uh, really hold a lot of promise. And George Gilbert and I did uh, a breaking analysis on this today. George actually, I think, had is a tremendous contribution, basically saying, look, it's the consumer stuff is not as interesting. It's the enterprise stuff. The consumer stuff, he used the analogy, it's like Magellan sailing off the edge of the ocean, you know, where the ship is going and it really doesn't know where it's going, whereas the enterprise, you can make a you can make a goal. You can set a goal. You have a plan. You know where you know where the grocery store is. You know where the library is, and you're setting the ship in that direction. And it doesn't end up a derelict. It actually meets its destination. So, 
this is kind of the next wave that we see coming and we think it's going to become uh, a mainstream topic. I think, I think it also feeds the path to AGI, right? So super intelligence agents are the first step towards that. I think that's going to be the very big key thing. Um, I think the agent thing is real. I mean, I think you look at all the private AI conversations um, three years ago, Chris Wolf at VMware um, brought it up to Raghu, who was the leading technologist at VMware. And by the way, VMware had a lot of technical people. I said earlier, they didn't really innovate, but they did a lot of technical. Great things. engineers. They're great Fantastic engineering. engineers. Very engineering. -oriented. By the way, Broadcom is an engineering company too. They just make chips. Yep. Absolutely. So, so I think there is a little synergy on that orientation towards innovation, but Broadcom is much more hardcore in making money. Let's just face it. <laughs> <laughs> VMware so is the like thing, a, the, the old thing VMware here, is like a country club, Dave. It had great cafeteria. It's like very Google, like almost like HP, the old HP meets Google. Very not academic, but like very employee friendly. They win awards every year. The new VMware is make the numbers and you get, here's more millions in stock. So it's a wholly different culture um, and scale. And with Broadcom is much lower scale than than say VMware on there, at least on the enterprise software side. So outside of that cultural mat, uh, mismatch, um, which is getting solved, they have the same culture and making money. I, I just want to come back, just to put a put a uh, a pin on uh, the agentic AI. Think of LLMs becoming LAMs, large language models become large action models, and so that's something that we are paying attention to and really starting to dig into. The research side so a company called adept ai out of san francisco just just um, put out a release on their blog that their founders were hired by amazon to do agi and they're not buying the company but the founders are leaving so it's a red flag for me because founders and companies have to be around otherwise they'll die so i'm going to dig into this but apparently amazon hired the two founders okay um it's gonna be very really? interesting yeah and then also Amazon's licensing their agent technology. Okay. It's multimodal models for automating enterprise workloads. Okay. So they got an agent stack. So um, head of engineering will take over as the CEO and the two founders are moving on to uh, Amazon. So it's kind of an accu hire meets business deal. I've never seen this before. Okay. At this level of, of hype and reality, you got the hot company, Adept AI in San Francisco with a great opportunity and the two founders join Amazon and the company license the technology to Amazon for a deal. So they do a business deal and technology deal and the founders go work there. So why not just do an acquisition? I don't get it. So that's weird. So either they were forced out and they land at Amazon and cut a deal but they've already been in talks with other companies to be, be bought, Microsoft and others. So it's a very interesting power dynamic. I got to tell you, I've never seen never seen that before. So again, you know, I hate to see when investors kind of force founders out because it happened to me. Um, they were talked to they were talking to Microsoft a week ago. That was reported on Fortune. Um, maybe they're shopping themselves around. They don't have a buyer, and they thought get the founders out. Mm. Or why would a founders leave their company to go work for Amazon? I mean, it, what, does that make any sense to you? Well, they lost the board, maybe. Right? Maybe, maybe yeah. the power board. Well, that's happened to Sam Altman, too. Uh, very, very, very interesting thing. Um, what else is going on? Um, it's you summertime. Know, you, 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 you sparked something in my head to talking about Amazon agents. One of the other examples we used was Amazon.com. Not Amazon Web Services, Amazon.com. Sorry to keep going back to Agentic AI, but they have a sales and operations planning using a collection of agents. And the reason I want to bring this up is because we see this becoming a horizontal. It's like our Uber for the enterprise. This is like this example for the common enterprise. So they forecast 400 million items weekly. And they, they forecast their distribution center requirements five years into the future. So an agent does long-term planning it's going to figure out how much distribution center capacity needs to be built and where another agent has to configure the layout of each distribution center uh, yet another one figures out how much of each skewed order for each supplier for the next delivery cycle all these agents working in concert and the thing is they're not just doing a single task with a start and a finish they're actually optimizing multiple tasks what's that book that we love about the system you know you, you know what i'm talking about um where you're not oh. just pushing deck chairs around, 
but you're looking at an entire system and the machines are smart enough and the agents understand the interdependencies and are, and are building plans and then optimizing plans with human supervision. So this is a really powerful example in a supply chain with amazon.com, you know, the greatest retail e-commerce company in the world. <clears throat> and, and the vision is that that gets technology becomes a horizontal stack that many, many more companies can take advantage of that in a simplified manner. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about the changes going on is amazing. And I want to, the, the, the AI thing is, I was just talking with someone on the phone today about how in every inflection point, it's the simplicity, the ease of use, intuitive nature of it, of the, of the process or application. And then you got to reduce the step it takes. So agents will do that. And so I think that's what I look for and that's changing the user experiences. So I think the whole classic, how people consume information is radically changed. And I think there's new things we don't even know yet, like voice activation, push notifications. There's new infrastructure capabilities in the cloud that will make change how UX is done. No longer are we doing the websites. They're all applications. So I think I think this tsunami of generative AI applications is coming. And the old school classic user experience design and UI design is going to be radically uplifted and changed, flipped upside down. And whoever builds that will build a new brand. I got someone on LinkedIn's like, I, I love the cube, but they're they're age they're too old the young kids don't know who john and dave are <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> i'm like you'd be surprised all the content we put out there i mean we're, we're spraying it everywhere so they probably do know us through our content but we don't actually have that kind of like uh, brand recognition to you know do the vanity thing like the all all in podcast they're very focused on consumer and trying to win the crowd and they do politics and whatnot but i think what what, what he's saying is, is that the new generation of people are building new apps and the old bogeys like us put call us old the systems people are all back and still in the game so this idea that people are leaving the game is of tech is ridiculous so this is why i love this confluence of the generation gaps and i think generational diversity i said earlier is a huge issue. And I think when you look at generational diversity, um, this is a real opportunity for our kids, Dave, the Gen Zs to come in and really rise up through the ranks of companies. Because if you look at like even people you see on the news covering the debate to VCs, to real people of power, if you're a smart Gen Z person, you could rise right up because what's happening is, is that a lot of the folks who built business over the past few decades and cycles don't have the Gen Z understanding because those applications for that audience those requirements will be completely different. So not only diversity in terms of male, female, in terms of people who use the product, which is 50% male, 50% female, beyond that kind of gender diversity, because you got to figure in features for all the genders, you got generational age diversity. And I see my two Gen, four Gen Z folks, like my kids, like they're just their, their view on things. So they could rise right to the top. And you're starting to see that now in companies, venture firms, Politics, media, generational diversity will be a hot topic. And I'm telling you right now, this is going to be a really, really big deal. And um, I'm totally all over it because, you know, we are smart, you and I, but there's things that we're not going to catch that a Gen Z person will catch. Little things, tweaks, experience, memes, all the stuff that goes on around how people consume content, how people view the world. Um, and I think that's that's where a lot of these politics miss the boat and the, the back to the debate thing again. So I, I'm done with my little rant there. But I always get confused on the g generation. So I'm, I got I'm looking it up here. Generation Alpha is 12 and under now. Okay, okay. Gener Gen Z is 12 to 27. So that's I guess that's our kids. All right. right? I hate the name already, Alpha. First of all, that's a typical exercise. I know, right? You know, like Millennials are like 28 to to early 40s. Gen X is like mid forties to late fifties. Yeah. Boomers are in the sixties. Sorry, boomers too. There's two boomers, Generation Jones. I never knew this. There's boomer two, which is 60 to 69. And there's boomer one, which is 70 to 78. And then there's post-war, which is 79 to 96. And then there's World War II, which is a hundo. I never knew that. I thought Gen X was younger, but <clears throat> there you go. I'm a, so our I'm kids te I'm are Gen Z, right? I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer, Dave. I'm on the bubble. 80, 65 is when Gen I was Xer, born. Gen Xer, I'm yeah. a boomer. I'm a late, late boomer. I mean, basically, I mean, if you're in 65, you're essentially on the back end of the boomer generation. That's who me. But I actually grew up in that Xer 
you know, I love the memes about Gen X's. We're, apparently, we're the generation that, you know, let, were neglected, rode bikes without helmets, did stupid stuff, drank from garden hoses, you know. I know. I was talking about that the other day. I got some workers at my house, and my wife, you know, likes to take care of them. She's like, oh, I'm sorry I'm not there. I can't, like, bring them out some water or something. Like, yeah, use the hose. You know, we, we used to use the hose as kids. Like, you can't use the garden hose anymore. <laughs> I think I it's think, too I, dirty. I think, I think we have a mix of millennials and Gen Zs on our team. I think we got a few millennials. Millennials are lazy, from what what people say. What do you think about that, Dave? <laughs> millennials are lazy. <laughs> that, well, uh, that, that depends, right? I mean, that's the, that's the meme that goes around. I laugh at that because it's like, no, they work smarter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, that's their answer to me. It's like I'm we're, not, tell you, we're my, not lazy. My, we just we just work smarter. I have, have a higher IQ. I have a millennial on the bubble, I guess, a Gen Z or millennial. My my kids work their ass off and so you know i think yeah. it's more it's a, just it's, a it's about generalization yeah i didn't know generation jones that's weird right that's what does that that's mean news, news to me I, I know generation jones i mean let me ask a follow-up <laughs> you're in the neural network pathway dave and perplexity i am i mean it's just it made this beautiful table for me it was amazing yeah, yeah. i mean so generation of- jones refers to micro generation or cohort born between 54 and 65. So you are in the bubble, falling between baby boomers and Gen X. Origin of the term was coined by cultural commentator Jonathan Pontell to describe those born in the latter half. This makes no sense to me. Yeah, because anyway. they're the ba- baby boomer generation. Remember the baby boomer? Why boomers? Generation Jones? The 50s was the baby boom. That's when, you know, prosperity hit, post-depression. Um, that was a generational shift. So they called them baby boomers because of the baby boom. Boomers, just for short. I yeah, do. Know I, I do know. That. I do know that because all my older. Boomers oh, because keeping again, Generation Joneses. It's associated with the moniker having several interesting. Keeping up with the Joneses, right? The competitive nature of the generation, and then anonymity. Jonesing. Remember Jonesing? I got a basketball Jones. Remember that? The, 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 the <laughs> Boomers killed that. That's the reason why we're in all this politics, probably because the Boomers they killed everything for us. All the people below them. They're gonna be, I'll get some comments on that. Yeah, the one. first, the first, first round of boomers, right? Well, they had it made, right? Because if they, if you bought like real estate in the early '80s, you know, all the, you got the beautiful house on the water because it was affordable. And, all right, Dave. Uh, so, what are you gonna do this uh, summer? We got the summer coming up. You take a couple weeks vacation. What are you gonna do? Yeah, you know, we're gonna get down the Cape. Some, um, you know, mostly gonna work going to catch up <laughs> we've been on the road for a while and then yeah. i was looking at the calendar today you know we got we got some events coming up we got yeah we got the the super studio in in third week of july we got super cloud seven coming up the last week of july a- so aws AW summit in new york city oh yeah but gosh what am i talking about july 10th we got aws summit juniper um, Network so got, is doing a doing a super studio at their we got building three, four we got like four events in july and by the way super cloud seven the next data platform, if you got a point of view on that, you know, we're doing outreach now and lining up guests. If you're in the Palo Alto area and you're awesome, let us know because and you can talk to governance and all the next data platform and all the cool stuff that's going on there around AI and Gen AI and Agentic AI. We want you in studio live. Uh, or we're doing some pre-records. Jamak Dagani is headlining again. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. I don't know if I told you that. Yeah, did not lined did, her up. Did, did not know. She's awesome. awesome. And then... And then we have we have Dipti uh, we, from Microsoft's coming on. Dipti is a, is amazing. Then yeah. is Oracle Cloud World the first week of September. We got Fa, uh, uh, Falcon CrowdStrikes event the second week of September. I mean, it's just starting all over again. And then August did we got a uh, Black Hat. So we got VMware Explore. We just, it's just uh, gonna I'm going to be at the New York Stock Exchange on Jul- uh, Jan- July 10th. So if anyone's in town in New York, I know New York's a ghost town in the summer. But if you're in New York, 9th and 10th. Oh, then uh, in mid-August we got. Don't we have another event in the New York Stock Exchange that we're doing? Yeah, Aug- August That's 20th. In motion. Can't announce that yet because we don't. Have, we don't have the. Uh, we can't announce that yet. Okay, uh, but, August but 20th. We're working on that. So it's yeah, like we're going we're gonna to do a super. We get a packed summer. It's we're going to do a super studio in the New York Stock Exchange. About four hours of interviews. We're going to have a great time there. Um, that that. So we're also doing a digital twin. Um, t- uh, a set of interviews around the event that the st- uh, we did in Silicon Valley with all the top capital market players, all the power players in capital markets, funding, M and A, um, all the IPO track, which we're now getting a lot into with our coverage. 
um, all those people are going to be doing some interviews with me and some really top CEOs and founders who are just kicking ass. A lot more experts coming in, Dave. One of the things I love about what's going on with this market right now with our business is that our expert network of friends and, and colleagues is just the collaboration. I think we're seeing the beginnings of what is lining up in this neural network world we're in, where social networking is now becoming physical, face-to-face, -face, blended, digital, a digital twin of relationships, a digital twin of experiences can be leveraged digitally. And what happens is interesting because our we're pulling in more experts, so our commentary gets better. Our, our societal um, ability to produce data gets better. Our ability to collect information gets better. So a flywheel is developing around clusters. So we're going to just document more and more interviews. You can see a lot more interviews from the cube. If you're listening and you want to reach out, hit me up on, on any of the channels on, on social media. Um, but yeah, me too. Experts, I forgot to say, I, I got to tell you, we're doing, there. we're doing the MIT. It's not MIT anymore, but I'll throw it out there. It used to be the MIT CDO IQ. We can't say MIT anymore, but even though I just said MIT, a lot of MIT DNA. So it's the CDO IQ in Cambridge, uh, third At, week of July. Is it at MIT? At MIT? It's not anymore. They, oh, they, 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 they didn't want the using the MIT brand anymore because the guys who run the conference have monetized it. And they're like, Oh, we're MIT. We, we only, we can monetize our pledges, not you. And so it was one of those things, but it's a great conference. All CDOs, Sanjeev Mohan's coming out. He's going to come on the cube. We have, we have chief data officers. We have, um, we have public sector people. Uh, we got regulated industry data quality people. Uh, we got the new CEO of Tamer coming on that Stonebreakers company, uh, Alation's going to be there. We're going to have a two days of wall to wall coverage. at at CDO IQ. It's That's just awesome. nonstop. It's going to be incredible. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and what research you're working on, I'm working on a, uh, the next data platform. We got my own little take on that. I'm working on a, um, a comprehensive kind of like a gen AI, um, enterprise piece. I'm working on a lot of Amazon, the future of Amazon and Amazon Web Services. Uh, I'm working on a bunch of stories there, and also working on the 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 con confluence between um, business value of technology and disruptive deep tech uh, evolution. Meaning, meaning the impact of deep tech impacting business. Because it's interesting. You know, working with the New York Stock Exchange and the New York crowd, it's interesting to me because I'm from the East Coast originally. I, I kind of see that bias in the past where people from the East Coast come out to cover Silicon Valley to understand what's going on. Actually, Silicon Valley is now pervasive in other places. So, and technology is ubiquitous. So the technology, deep tech is impacting stock prices more than it's ever been before. So not just tech companies. Everybody's a tech company. So you look at all the businesses that are moving fast and growing the fastest. They are, in essence, tech companies, Dave. They're cloud, cloud operations, software, and data. And so they're becoming their own tech companies. So I think the Facebooks of the world, these old, quote, tech, tech companies that people are throwing under the bus right now, will probably morph away and maybe even get regulated or die. Who knows? But you know, Twitter's turning into essentially you know, a, a, a news outlet in terms of its own thing. It's pretty biased with Elon. Facebook is Facebook. Instagram's Instagram. WhatsApp, WhatsApp. That's just all one company. LinkedIn's the walled garden. So I think you're going to see more things emerge. It's going to be interesting to see, Dave. I got to say, I'm one, that's a, it's a unique, it's one of my pet projects, you know, the confluence of physical love relationships. These, I love yeah. these pet projects, John. Yeah. I, I, I have one that I'm working on now with my friends at ETR. We're doing a, a flash survey um, on, we haven't got, we haven't, you know, I think it's going to happen, but I'll tell you anyway, if it doesn't happen, don't hold me to it, but it's, I think it's going to happen. Coming out of Databricks and Snowflake's uh, events, again, they, every year, they change the narrative. They change the world, not not flip in a flip flop way, but they evolve. They 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 accelerate the these trends, and it's kind of like a ping pong match. And so the last one was, as you know, you, we were we were there, um, the whole notion of open governance, and so we are taking the, it th this is both a philosophical and a technical debate, if you will, mm -hmm. and so we're gauging. We're going at we're we're going to talk to small n you know, 50 or so customers that are both Snowflake and Databricks customers and identify their thinking around open table formats, how they're thinking about governing these, governing those formats. Are they thinking about 
uh, using Pol uh, Polaris, which is the open source version of the technical metadata from Snowflake, and then using Horizon, which is their proprietary role-based ba access control and other you know, heavy governance, or are they looking toward Unity, uh, which is, is going to potentially uh, merge Iceberg and Delta and uh, with Uniform? Is their philosophy more toward bring any engine to any data, Ali Goetze, or is it going to be more, you know, you're going to have a safer environment inside of Snowflake? Uh, and so we're going to gauge the sentiment of the leading practitioners in that base and then present it at SuperCloud 7. Awesome. Uh, we got so much going on. If you're listening, lo love to get some feedback on the podcast. Give us um, any kind of tips you think we like, want to hear more of. Um, SiliconAngle.com is where all the traffic is. That's where the main news stories are. The cube.net's the catalog of the content. We're also looking at our sites. You can start to see a lot more generative AI with the cube that's coming in ne out next year. And again, the analyst piece, uh, analyst led content. Go to SiliconAngle.com, look for those featured stories uh, and, uh, on enterprise and emerging tech. Dave, great to see you. Have a great vacation. Thanks, John. Uh, we're going to do the podcast while you're on vacation next Friday, of course. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. You, what's your backdrop? The ocean or what's uh, what's going to be the backdrop? And I'll, I'll be a blurred. Probably a blurred. <laughs> not set up really well. Like, the mess is came. Cover the mess up. <laughs> All right. Thanks for thanks for coming on, Dave. Have a great vacation. See you next time. Thanks. See you, John.